Thank you everyone again for joining our webinar, uh, COVID-19 and telehealth, new imperatives for remote treatment of diabetes. And I just checked the numbers, seems like we have more than thousand people joining today. So clearly there's demand and interest in these topics. So thank you so much for joining. And before I go into introducing our participants, we are obviously living very interesting and perhaps very difficult times and COVID-19 has brought more attention and also highlighted the importance of one, telemedicine, and then two, treating diabetes and chronic conditions, uh, given the substantially increased risk for poor COVID-19 outcomes if, if you have chronic diseases. And now when you combine these two needs, telemedicine and perhaps better treating diabetes and chronic conditions, the question is, what can be done? What should be done? What can we improve? And where are we headed uh, during this pandemic and after this? Perhaps simply replicating traditional episodic care in a virtual setting isn't exactly the best thing we can do. Maybe there's something we can do even better. And fortunately, we have an amazing group of experts today, and I, I certainly don't count myself as, as one of those. So we have an amazing group of experts, scientists and clinicians on this webinar today. So we will hear from them and their perspectives. What are their thoughts on, on those two topics that I mentioned? And as Shannon mentioned in the beginning, the format that we have today is that we have one expert speaking after another, and then we have Q&A at the very end. However, you can use the Q&A function in Zoom to post your questions at any point. And again, we'll get to them at the very end of this session. So we will start with, um, actually, why don't I mention all of our experts here, uh, if you just joined. So we have Dr. Bob Bradner, Dr. Martin Abrahamson, Dr. Francine Kaufman, and Dr. Santanu Nandi, and then myself. And I'm very grateful for all of these scientists and clinicians to join us here today. And we will start with uh, Dr. Bob Radner, who will open up with the latest updates on COVID-19 and diabetes research and outcomes that have been published. And just briefly about uh, Dr. Radner's background. He is currently the Chief Medical Officer of Verda Health. And prior to that, Dr. Radner was the Chief scientific and medical officer for the American Diabetes Association. And he's also a professor of medicine at Georgetown University Medical School in, in Washington, DC. And after 35 years of active patient care and clinical research in diabetes, he served about five years, as I mentioned earlier, as the chief scientific and medical officer at the American Diabetes Association. It's a very accomplished clinician and scientist. And with that, I'll hand it over to Bob. So over to you. Thank you so much, Sami. It's a pleasure to be here with you. It's hard to believe that we've only been dealing with COVID-19 for 100 days here in the United States. But the amount of information that has been gathered about the role of COVID-19 and diabetes is really remarkable. Even from the very early studies in China, it was very apparent that diabetes was disproportionately uh, impacted by COVID-19. Here you see a range of different studies that look at the prevalence of diabetes by severity. What you see is that in the non-severe cases, what you get is basically a background rate of diabetes in the normal population. In the US, 9.4% of individuals with COVID-19 have non-severe disease and are diabetic. That's the same rate of diabetes in the normal, uh, in the, the total population. But what's very apparent here is regardless of the population, diabetes is disproportionately represented in those with severe disease. Up to 32% of those in the ICUs in the United States have diabetes. What's even more important is that 
is that there is a disproportionate effect on survival. What you see here are the, the survivors versus the non-survivors in the dark bars who have diabetes. Between 21 and 31% of all those people dying of COVID-19 have diabetes. So the question really becomes, what is the, the mechanism by which diabetes is currently affecting this level of severity of COVID-19? And we're just now beginning to get evidence to suggest that glucose control is actually playing a major role. In this study that's currently in press at the Journal of Diabetes, Diabetes Science and Technology, we begin to see the impact of glucose where those with diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia are admitted to the hospital with a mean glucose of 178 milligrams per deciliter, as opposed to those without diabetes who are at 116 milligrams per deciliter. You can also see that these individuals with diabetes have a disproportionate amount of time with, at glucose levels well in excess of 200 milligrams per deciliter. So what's the impact of all of this? What you begin to see is that individuals with diabetes or with uncontrolled hyperglycemia on admission have essentially a fourfold increase in mortality. Now, why is that? Is it the glucose per se? Is it the underlying diabetes? Well, as you note in the left-hand column, it says diabetes or uncontrolled hyperglycemia. The issue here is that we don't have hemoglobin A1C determinations on everybody at the time of admission to the hospital. So the only way we can differentiate pre-existing diabetes from either new onset diabetes or hospitalization associated hyperglycemia is by history. So that when we begin to look at the impact of glucose, what you can see in the left-hand bar is that only 13 subjects actually had hemoglobin A1Cs. Their mortality rate was approximately 15%. But regardless of the previous history of diabetes, hyperglycemia per se increased mortality to over 40%. So clearly, there is an impact of glucose on the severity and the morbidity and mortality of COVID-19. So what do we currently know? We know that people with diabetes are no more prone to getting the infection than individuals without diabetes. We know that if infected, people with diabetes are disproportionately requiring hospitalization and ICU admission. In addition, if infected, people with diabetes have a mortality rate that's approaching 20%. Elevated admission glucose is a poor prognostic indicator, regardless of the past medical history of diabetes. And ultimately, glucose control during COVID-19 matters. In a paper out in Lancet Diabetes just this week, an international group has made recommendations for the treatment of diabetes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Number one, bring people under good glycemic control. Number two, emphasize telehealth. Number three, use insulin during the hospitalization and discontinue metformin and SGLT2s because of the risk of, of metabolic acidosis. We're learning a lot. We have much more to learn. And I'm happy to turn the program over to our next speaker. Uh, thank you, Bob. This is Sami. I will um, introduce Martin in a second. First of all, thank you so much for sharing about what we know and what is the evidence around COVID-19 and diabetes. Uh, it, it obviously is not a good time to have diabetes and certainly not a good time to have a poorly controlled diabetes, as, as at least in light of the data that you shared. 
And it is interesting, I've seen um, in the Verda applicant comments, quite a few comments from a potential patient saying that uh, they're really concerned about their diabetes and diabetes status because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think the word is getting out there that um, the combination of those two is, is and can be very deadly, actually. So next we'll move to Dr. Martin Abrahamson, who will uh, talk more about the telemedicine angle. And I'll just give you a brief background of Dr. Abrahamson. So he is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and also director of the Division of Continuing Medical Education in the Department of Medicine uh, and an active faculty member at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Abrahamson's career started in Cape Town, South Africa, and eventually led him to Boston, where he joined the faculty at Jocelyn Diabetes Center in 1992. At Jocelyn, he held positions as Chief of Adult Diabetes, Chief Medical Officer, and Senior Vice President for Medical Affairs. He has authored more than 80 papers, reviewed articles and chapters related to diabetes. Uh, we're super excited to have you with us today, Martin. So I'll hand it over to you and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sami. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart because for many years, I and many others have been promoting the use of telemedicine in helping uh, people with diabetes achieve and maintain good glucose control. So I'm going to give you a bit of a historical perspective. I'm gonna talk about some of the numbers in terms of people with diabetes in the United States and healthcare professionals who look after them uh, and the challenges they're in, and then talk about potentially what I think the role of telemedicine can play in helping people with diabetes achieve and maintain a good glucose control, which we all heard about is fundamentally important, not only um, with regard to COVID-19, but with regard to long-term complications of the disease. Uh, <clears throat> historically, um, I refer to uh, uh, Clayton Christensen, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year. Uh, he was professor of um, uh, business uh, at professor at Harvard Business School, and he coined the term disruptive innovation in business many years ago, and then applied the term more than a decade ago to managing people with chronic diseases and generally in the healthcare industry. And his concept was, uh, in terms of disruption, was instead of bringing the problem to the solution, which is what people did for many years, making uh, people go to uh, centralized areas for all their health care, he said, let's be disruptive and move the solution to the problem. In other words, take the, the solution, in other words, managing health care to clinics, to offices, and ultimately into the homes of individuals. And some years ago, uh, uh, this began to take place. Uh, this is an old study that I'm gonna show you, not because it, uh, it, it tells us a lot of information today, but because with the technology available at the time, and that was more than a decade ago, these individuals undertaking the study looked at the idea of remote managing of hypertension in people with diabetes to see if they could improve blood pressure control which as you know, is an important comorbidity in people with diabetes, particularly type two diabetes. And so they did have Bluetooth enabled um, blood pressure cups connected to a mobile phone, uh, which then um, when people took their blood pressures was relayed to a, a server. Um, and then the information was relayed to a healthcare provider. And just the simple system of receiving blood pressure measurements and sending critical alerts and reports back to patients led to a significant 10 millimeter systolic and five millimeter diastolic lowering of blood pressure into the 130 millimeter systolic range, which I think was fairly significant. Now the problem today with diabetes is that we have 34 million people with this disease, 25% of them are undiagnosed, 95% of these individuals have type two diabetes. It is truly what many of us call a burgeoning epidemic. And if we look at the projected numbers over the next 10 years, it is easily conceivable uh, and as conservative estimate 
is that the increase will be at least 15% in the number of people with diabetes. So we're talking about a, preval a, a number of people with diabetes going from 34 to at least 39 million. If we look at um, the number of clinicians able to manage people and the number of primary care physicians and endocrinologists who are actively engaged in clinical practice, we see that roughly 209,000 primary care physicians and 6,500 endocrinologists are actively today engaged in clinical practice. And if we look at these numbers uh, of 34 million people, that means then there's one primary care physician to take care of 162 patients. If we apply a rule of 80-20, which means that 80% of people will be, with diabetes will be cared for by their primary care physician, and perhaps the most difficult to control 20% will be referred to endocrinologists. There's roughly one endocrinologist for a thousand patients with difficult to manage diabetes. If we think of the number of active primary care physicians and endocrinologists that are going to uh, in, uh, increase in the next 10 years, I uh, don't believe that we will see a 15% increase in either the number of PCPs or endocrinologists who will be available to manage people with diabetes, and yet 15% is the conservative estimate uh, of the increase in, pre in number of people with this condition. The other problem that we deal with in the healthcare system is that most systems today have been oriented and, and, and uh, uh, designed to treat acute medical problems, despite the fact that up until the COVID situation, chronic conditions like diabetes accounted for the majority of healthcare costs. Uh, at least 70% of US healthcare dollars have been spent uh, uh, at, until the last year or so in the management of chronic non-communicable diseases. And these conditions require multidisciplinary care, patient self-education and self-care on an ongoing manner. So what can telemedicine do to help provide this backbone for chronic disease management? I think it can enhance the quality of care, it can reach more patients. It can reach more patients uh, more frequently. I think chronic care delivery can be more effectively uh, provided uh, to people with chronic conditions. We can use telemedicine to empower patients using evidence-based guidelines. We can also give feedback to providers using tele telemedicine to um, improve their compliance with treatment guidelines that they should be made aware of. These, uh, with chronic uh, conditions and the uh, um, in online medical records and telehealth, we can identify patients who need specific aspects of care that haven't been attended to recently. And we can certainly facilitate patient self-care by providing education uh, online and communication tools that can allow direct feedback to the patient. So if we take Clayton Christensen's um, model of disruptively innovating healthcare. And um, the, the, he's, wrote, he's written books about this specifically around healthcare. We can see a model that evolves to something like this, where we do have a centralized tertiary or quaternary care institution, but everything else is disrupted and decentralized um, to provide uh, Im important care delivery to people who need it through blood uh, monitoring of uh, conditions in the home precision diagnostics, um, using uh, telecommunications to provide and coaching to provide wellness programs to patients, doing telehealth visits, um, uh, and even having automated kiosks uh, um, in, in areas in, in the community where certain measurements can be performed or blood, uh, blood, uh, blood tests taken and so on to provide all of the tools that are necessary at a decentralized level to help people uh, manage their condition. My final slide looks at something that could ultimately um, uh, should be taking place. Uh, on the bottom, we have our patient who has Bluetooth enabled uh, scales, glucose monitoring devices, uh, uh, including continuous glucose monitoring devices, insulin delivery systems, um, exercise apps that measure uh, activity, blood pressure measurement, all being um, uh, inputted into a, a smartphone that then uh, sends the information into the cloud uh, into a decision support system. 
the potential of artificial intelligence to help uh, promote personalized diabetes decision support is something that is not far away. Uh, ultimately, that information is relayed to a clinician um, who can verify uh, certain decision supports that are taken, uh, which are then fed back into the patient. And then there's also the opportunity to provide customized diabetes self-management education, um, nutrition, uh, how to use insulin, delivery of insulin, uh, new technologies, et cetera, that, can, uh, that the patient can access in the cloud uh, to help him or her achieve uh, her or his goals and improve aspects of self-care and improve um, uh, diabetes empowerment. And I think that this concept of chronic care delivery and chronic care management is something that is not far off. Uh, and in some ways, there's always a silver lining from something that's negative. And I do believe that the, uh, one of the, the positive things, uh, if anything can be called positive that comes out of COVID-19, is the fact that telemedicine has really come of age. Um, uh, I and many others um, have been uh, forced to manage patients with diabetes uh, using telemedicine for the last six, seven weeks. I think we've done it fairly successfully, and I think we've finally proved to the insurance companies, uh, because they're now um, on, on board with paying for these services, that this is an effective way to manage chronic conditions. And with that, I'll thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to chat to you and hand it back to you, Sami. Yeah, uh, th th thank you so much. Martin, uh, very, very informative. And as, as you mentioned, if there's some positive to come out of COVID-19, it, it has been already wonderful to see how uh, the reimbursement for telemedicine visits has been made much easier for, for providers. And then secondly, of course, uh, many of the regulatory barriers have been struck down, making it easier for providers to adopt telemedicine. Um, so next, we'll move to Dr. Francine Kaufman. So Francine, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. And she will uh, give the patient-provider perspective or the dynamics between patient and provider in this kind of a telehealth-driven world. And a little bit about her, quite frankly, absolutely amazing background. So Dr. Francine Kaufman is the Chief Medical Officer of Sentionics and also a distinguished professor emerita of Pediatrics and Communications at the University of Southern California. And previously, she was the Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Global Regulatory Clinical and Medical Affairs at Medtronic Diabetes for, for about a decade until 2019. She's also an attending physician at Children's Hospital LA and or Los Angeles, and previously served as head of the Center for Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism. Uh, Dr. Kaufman was also a president of the American Diabetes Association around 2002-2003 and elected to the National Association of Medicine. Uh, she's been the medical director of diabetes camps in Southern California, Ecuador, and Haiti for over 30 years. Uh, I, I don't know how it is possible that that's one person's bio and not four different individuals, but uh, this is one person, so very excited to have you with us today. So Francine, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you, Sami, for that wonderful introduction. And I'd like to welcome you all into my home office. Um, it's important because this is where I've been delivering medical care now for about the last six to seven weeks. And I want to talk a little bit about my experience, as well as others and what I need to prepare, what my patients need to prepare for, for a telehealth visit. I call it telehealth. Uh, Martin called it telemedicine. There's essentially really no difference between those terms. Maybe it's an east-west differentiation. So first, I do want to stress that um, there are many key points about telehealth, and um, I, I think this is a wonderful time for me to follow on what both Bob and Martin had to uh, say. Telehealth is not just a phone call. It's not a substitute for a healthcare visit. It is, in fact, the healthcare visit itself. And it should not and has not been historically just a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It was here before, and I think there's all evidence to suggest it will be here after in even greater amounts. And it's not hard. I mean, I think people are concerned, oh, it's too hard to do, too much technology. It's really no more diff difficult than what we're all doing 
today for this virtual uh, lecture. So what is telehealth? It's a legitimate billable healthcare encounter, and it's really a component of the longitudinal care of our patient. And in many ways, it affords a much greater time to converse, to understand, to reach out, and to develop an action plan and shared goals that I think are important for both the provider and the patient. So what I'd like to do is kind of talk about what does one of my patients need to do and then what do I need to do in response? And let me use a patient example of one of my patients. I happen to have a telehealth visit with him last week. He's an 18 year old with type one diabetes. And at 18 now, of course, he can enter these telehealth visits as he can my own clinic by himself. But of course I asked if he would let his parents join for some portion of our telehealth visit so that we can do what we've been planning to do for about two years now, which is transition him to really virtually most of his own self-care as he gets ready to go to university next year. So I send out a, a checklist, a long list of things that my patients need to do to prepare for our telehealth visit. It involves really thinking about their health, thinking about their symptoms, thinking about their numbers, since I only do this with my patients with diabetes, and particularly thinking about what are their goals, and I would like to know so that we can have shared goals at the end of the visit. Um, one of the people from my uh, hospital calls first to arrange the telehealth visit or does it virtually through an email to particularly assure that they have adequate technology for the visit. And then they're busy gathering the data, the glucose and the insulin records. I ask them to weigh themselves for my patients who are still growing. I've asked the parents to do what my parents did when I was growing up. They measured me against the wall. And what I want to know was what's the interval change in the patient's height over time. They need to, of course, understand their insulin dosages, any other medications they would be on, and a bit of an assessment as to their adherence. Then perhaps the hardest thing for the patient is really to do a review of systems that physicians have done uh, over the decades and actually centuries of going from head to toe. So what is going on with each of those body parts? And if there's something that concerns you, please write it down before the visit so that we can discuss it during the time of our telehealth visit. In a similar way, I ask them to almost do a physical examination. Look at themselves in the mirror. Is there anything that bothers them? Look at their skin, particularly their injections or their technology insertion sites. If there's something that concerns them, there's many ways to take pictures of that. And there's, I think, going to be an increasing number of tips that we can all use that will help us actually assess when it's our turn to actually go through a physical examination with them. I uh, want to discuss their lifestyle, particularly now how they're adapting to uh, the, you know, the physical distancing and being home now with his parents and his older sibling for a number of weeks. Um, want to look at his supplies and does he have enough? What do we need to get from a prescription standpoint? And then most importantly, what is he concerned about? What are we going to do at the end? What's going to be our action plan? What does he want that to be? And then I ask all of my patients to keep a record of what transpired. Of course, I ask them to keep the same record of when we have a traditional visit inside my hospital. So what was my patient focused on? He was focused on getting independent to be ready to go to college. Um, one of his concerns is he seems like he's lost weight. So when he did weigh himself, his uh, weight loss seemed to be about five pounds. Um, so he was concerned that um, about a little bit about food security for his family, um, although didn't feel he was actually cutting back on his eating, concerned about being able to get enough exercise. And so this was what he had listed and really super prepared for our visit. So on my end, what did I do to prepare? Um, I had to be sure, of course, that my patient had the adequate technology. Of course, I know I have the adequate technology on my end in my little home office now. Um, and before we start that telehealth visit, 
since there's not a number of forms for him to fill out as he would when he comes to see me in my clinic at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, um, I asked for his consent for this telehealth visit and reminding him, of course, that this is a real medical encounter. It will be in his medical records. And as a result, in addition, he will be billed for it. And then we did review that uh, review of systems and his physical examination. Um, he had a little bit of concern over one of his injection sites, um, uh, I mean, rather insertion sites. He happens to be on both an insulin pump and a CGM. And when we had him upload all of that, it was pretty remarkable to me as I'm reviewing all of his glucometrics and insulin dosages, that there were days in which he barely had an insulin bolus. He could look at the records, I could look at the records, we're looking at his pump and his CGM uploads together now. And um, you know, just kind of curiously asked, what did he think was going on? Was he not eating? Was he so concerned about food security? He said no, he was eating, but maybe he was forgetting to do his boluses. So of course the proof was in the pudding. It turned out that his overall uh, mean glucose value was about 275. Um, and when you look at all the records, the entire reason for his weight loss is there. He is no longer managing his diabetes. His parents have really tried to transfer over to him this preparedness to be able to go out of their home to university next year. And in fact, he failed this initial test. So we had to talk about really adherence. It was an amazing teachable moment for me of what were the barriers? Why couldn't he remember every time he prepared something to eat and put something in his mouth? Why could he not remember? Or why was he not in fact bolusing for his meals? We devised a follow-up plan. Of course, this now re-involves the parents. Um, the goal is to get him ready to go to college. The possibility is that he might actually have to take some more time at home, maybe a gap year. We'll have to see. It will be a decision between him and his family. And of course, I will be a bit of an advisor in all of this. I documented all of this in the EMR, and um, we plan to have not a full telehealth visit, but an interim visit where he will upload his data. We'll go over it again on a weekly basis. We'll talk again on a weekly basis. I got him with one of our healthcare providers on the psychosocial side, and that person will contact with him and have a telehealth visit on the psychosocial stream. So what I do believe is that telehealth is a way to actually kind of equalize between me and my patients. The encounter is more informal, it's conversational, it's more personal. They're in my home office. I was actually most of the time in his bedroom. Um, it frees the patient of that less constrained, this is my office, this is my turf kind of feeling, and we're both learning about each other's turf. In fact, not too long ago, one of my seven-year-old patients who I had a telehealth visit took his uh, computer and gave me a tour of his entire house, and um, we really connected on a way I was unable to ever connect with him uh, in the past. I have to rely much more on what my patient is reporting. And I have to feel trust, they have to feel trust in me. And I think it does engender more trust than what I can achieve in the clinic setting itself. And then we've got to really work equal to uh, have mutual goals to uh, re really reinforce that the care of a chronic illness is about my patient being the pilot of what goes on, and I'm really more of a co-pilot. So I think this is a great opportunity for us to re-envision and re-imagine how we can connect with our patients and help them through their journey, particularly with a chronic illness, such as type one diabetes, in my children, their families, and the emerging adults that I see. And um, I can guarantee you that this is something that will be here long after the COVID pandemic. So I thank you for this opportunity and I thank Sami and all of my co-presenters for such an amazing afternoon.
Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Kaufman. And uh, that was in, in many ways a wonderful presentation. And I, I really enjoyed hearing the sort of the qualitative side of how uh, telemedicine or telehealth, depending on which coast you're coming from, uh, experience can be. And using that term of provider being a co-pilot as opposed to the pilot, a co-pilot in, in the patient journey is, is a wonderful description. I, I really like that. Um, so next, we will move to Dr. Shantanu Nandi, and he will share a few specific examples of telehealth applications in the real world, um, and a little bit about his background. So Dr. Nandi is the Chief Medical Officer at Accolade, uh, a personalized advocacy company supporting employers of all sizes and industries. And as many of you might know, Accolade is the single place for employees and their family members to turn for personalized support for their health benefits and healthcare needs. And Accolade combines empathy, technology, and expertise to help people make the best decisions for their health and well being. And as the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Nandi directs Accolade's clinical strategy and solutions to improve health outcomes and the relationships between patients and their providers. Uh, Dr. Nandi is also a practicing primary care physician in the DC area and an expert in global health policy. He has conducted research at Harvard Medical, Schools, Harvard Medical School, Johns Hopkins, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So very excited to have Dr. Nandi here. So I will hand it over to you, and there you go. Perfect. Thanks so much, Sammy. Really appreciate the, that warm introduction. Um, you know, I uh, actually became a physician because uh, my mom has diabetes and, and a lot of people on my uh, maternal side uh, have diabetes. And so for me, this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. And what's interesting is that um, the way that we manage and diagnose diabetes is largely the same today uh, as it was when my mom was diagnosed, believe it or not, in the 19, uh, early 1990s. And I think I really share uh, the optimism of the other speakers here that, you know, just, you know, with this tragedy of COVID-19, I think it's really creating a catalytic opportunity for us to reimagine and rethink how healthcare works, uh, particularly for those with chronic conditions for whom the existing healthcare system uh, never really worked that well for. And so what I want to do today is really share three very specific examples of emerging clinical models that leverage this new virtual world that we've all been ushered into. And these are uh, based on three, three papers we just published uh, uh, recently uh, describing you know, a self-service model for diabetes, a second a one-to-many model for diabetes, and second is a mobile health-based model. And so we'll walk through those three examples, just as illustrative examples of the kinds of things that um, the virtual world that we're in could now enable. So on the first model, this idea of self-service, Dr. Ratner talked about how so many people that are presenting today with COVID-19 have hyperglycemia, and a lot of those people may have undiagnosed diabetes. That may seem shocking to people on some level, but that's been true uh, in diabetes care for a long time. Uh, a significant proportion of people with diabetes have not been diagnosed. Those that have been diagnosed uh, often are diagnosed six or seven years into their conditions. And we know that management uh, or control of people's diabetes has never really been optimal. Uh, if you graded the healthcare system and we say that 20 to 30 to 40% of the time we don't manage people, that's an F where I come from. And so the healthcare system hasn't been able to deliver the results that it's needed to get for some time. And so the idea of self-service is kind of radical, right? The idea is that, you know, patients today have access to blood glucose uh, machines that they can buy at a local CVS. And as uh, uh, Sammy mentioned earlier, with COVID-19, because of the awareness of diabetes as a risk factor, a lot of patients are coming to my clinic now and saying, hey, do I have diabetes? Well, we could put those two things together. Imagine a system whereby patients could actually test themselves at home, find that their blood sugar is high, potentially take a photograph of that blood sugar result, and then be connected on demand to a healthcare provider who would then complete the rest 
of their history and be able to then, with a confirmatory test, diagnose them with diabetes. And then from then onward, you could create an entire care system through custom interactions, automated technology, and of course, bringing in the expertise of physicians like Dr. Kaufman when needed. And in that way, really put the, the patient as the pilot uh, in control from sort of day one of their conditions. Um, and again, this not necessarily needs to be for every patient, but we know that for a number of patients, they never see the doctor. And that's particularly true for, uh, for racial and ethnic minorities, people with language barriers, other physical disabilities. And so the idea of, of, of chronic condition self-service is can we sort of stitch together the health system, but really putting the patient uh, as the starting point. The second model is this idea of really rethinking healthcare relationships in the digital age. Uh, Dr. Abertson talked about um, how if we wanted to manage every person with diabetes and we imagine that a certain percent of them need the expertise of an endocrinologist, he mentioned that even in the United States today, we don't have enough physicians and enough expertise to be able to manage those people. And at the same time, we know that patients have very complicated relationships. Um, as noted here, the average Medicare patient sees two PCPs and five specialists in a given year. The entire healthcare system is built around this idea of the one-to-one -one relationship between an individual doctor and an individual patient. Given these demands, could there be the possibility of creating uh, what we described as a one-to-many model, where an individual physician, uh, like an expert like Dr. Kaufman, could actually manage a full panel of, of, of patients, thereby expanding her impact to many more patients. There's some evidence showing that, you know, that especially for chronic conditions, people prefer these kinds of group-based models. People respond to peers. We've known that for decades of research in self-management uh, and diabetes prevention, showing that people learn from each other how to uh, manage their uh, medications, how to uh, make healthy food choices given their socioeconomic status. And so the promise of the idea of one-to-many is how do we start to give tools to empower um, expert clinicians to manage a larger number of patients so that more patients have access to that expertise? And some of the technologies that Dr. Abrams had mentioned, like chatbots, like social robots, um, and simply using things like AI to actually offload um, physicians so they don't have to spend as much time documenting, those are kinds of enabling technologies that could enable the democratization of the kind of expertise that so many patients with uh, diabetes need, but seldom we have access to. And then the third model that we talk about uh, is this idea of really leveraging the device that all of us carry with us at nearly every hour of the day, which is our cell phone. Um, this was work that I did with my colleagues um, at the Southside Diabetes uh, Collaborative in Chicago uh, a number of years ago, but again, that was sort of before the virtual world that we live in. But essentially we created a model which allows a patient to get enrolled in a automated uh, diabetes uh, self-management program that's delivered through simple SMS text messages. So they're enrolled by a nurse at their health plan. They set a set of preferences about how often they wanna be messaged, what kinds of things they want messaging for. They then uh, start receiving those messages. Some of those messages ask them questions like, how many days in the last seven days did you take your medications? What's your uh, emotional uh, state? And then that, that was then sometimes generating alerts to have that nurse call them back and potentially get them into clinic. And so in this way, we were able to create a system that helped manage people through the 5,000 hours, uh, waking hours of the year that people with diabetes have their conditions, um, yet spend the vast, vast, vast majority of that time outside um, of, of the clinic uh, environment. This was with uh, an employer uh, plan in Chicago. We were able to enroll a number of patients. Patients elected to get a, a high degree of text messages. We've, the average was 3.4 touch points a day. And if you think about the average diabetes patient, how often do they get touched by the health system a day? Zero. And we found that patients found that really satisfying. And then of course, from the results perspective, we're able to show dramatic decreases uh, in uh, healthcare costs. Um, and actually a net savings for the health plan, a net of the investment in the technology and the service that they had to provide. And so um, again, illuminating that there's value of these kinds of models to all the different stakeholders. 
Now, as these new models emerge, one of the key uh, sort of uh, concepts is we have to now personalize them, right? Not one model is not going to work for everybody. We have to really understand the needs of the individual patient. And so at Accolade, part of our perspective is we want to be that one resource, uh, that one place that patients can go for trusted information, and we can assess what their needs are. Sometimes patients' diabetes is out of control because they can't afford their medicines. That's the issue. Sometimes they, their diabetes is out of, out of control because they're kind of in denial. They don't want to take their medicines or they want to know if there's options for them to reverse their diabetes. And sometimes it's an underlying behavioral health condition. And so what we need to do as, we, as more and more models emerge is we need to be able to stitch that together and recommend the right service for people that's personalized to their needs. So in the first example, helping them identify more affordable medications. In the second example, potentially um, helping them understand that services like Verda exist that could actually help them reverse their diabetes, which in some of my patients, they find really motivating for those that just simply don't want uh, to, to live uh, with, with diabetes and want other options. And finally, for those that have underlying behavioral health conditions, we need to address the behavioral health condition. And so in this way, we can innovate, but at the same time, simplify the experience that so many of our patients find far too complex um, today. And together, be able to generate measurable health outcomes that our patients deserve, as well as the ultimate payers of healthcare are most interested in. Thanks for the opportunity to share some of these ideas with you. All right, sorry about that little slowness in my mouse clicking skills. Thank you, Dr. Nandi. So um, I will, so we've been talking about diabetes and, and telemedicine. It turns out Verda uh, does both and we combine those two things, diabetes scan, telemedicine. So I'm going to give a very brief overview how we address or have combined these two things at Verda and then we will go into the open Q&A where everyone will participate and again, all of you who have uh, called in, please use the Zoom's uh, Q&A function where you can enter questions and then we moderate them and answer those. So a little bit about Verda, it says here, continuous remote care. So that's a third uh, phrase for telemedicine or telehealth. So what we, the type of care we deliver, we call it the continuous remote care. And let's see if I have the control here. What we mean by that is, first of all, uh, Verda is not just technology. We're actually a virtual clinic that is provider-led. So we employ physicians who provide actual clinical care. And what we mean by this uh, continuous remote care, as it's seen from a patient perspective, is like in all kind of telemedicine, um, patients can access all this provider-led care from home. It's fully virtual. We don't touch our patients. Um, I think Dr. Nandi mentioned uh, in some of their experiences there were 3.4 touch points a day. That's very typical in Verda care. There's two to four, two to five interactions, usually asynchronous back and forth with our providers and patients. Um, we monitor patients remotely. So it's kind of like almost like an ICU experience, but remotely where we monitor a number of biomarkers from our patients on a, on a daily, sometimes hourly basis. And then based on that data that comes in, in this kind of a continuous remote care model, it's not just an episodic visit that the patient calls us, but we proactively intervene, whether that's medication, uh, deep prescription or something else. And uh, obviously, when we are treating type 2 diabetics, um, medication adjustments are absolutely critical. And of course, all these are just features uh, and benefits perceived by the patient, but ultimately the goal is better clinical outcomes. And when I say better clinical outcomes, we deliver diabetes management, but we set the bar very high, which is that our goal with every single one of our patients is not just to uh, deliver slightly better glycemic control, but actually reach what we call diabetes reversal or diabetes remission, depending on which, which language is, is your preference. And there's a quote here on the right-hand side from one of our patients recently in this COVID-19 related world. And I think I mentioned that in the beginning that we are seeing this more and more among our patients that they've heard that combination of COVID-19 and diabetes is, is really, really harmful. Um, so a little bit, how do we do this? And I'll, I'll keep this very brief. Uh, what we do at Verda in our virtual clinic diabetes care, it's really a combination of two things. I'll start from the right-hand side, which is really the 
telemedicine virtual clinic part. So again, we are a provider-led virtual clinic where we monitor patients remotely a uh, number of times a day, check their biomarkers, and then we use software, and I, I think uh, Dr. Nandi mentioned AI. Since ev most of the things we do is asynchronous, we can use software and machine learning to then analyze the data that comes in and proactively allocate our human and other resources to reach out to the patient, whether that's problem solving, support, uh, medication deprescription, or something else. So that's the virtual clinic part of what Verda does. And we call this continuous remote care because it's not episodic. So that's the right-hand side. And then the left-hand side, again, I mentioned earlier that our goal is not just to, quote-unquote, support the patient, but actually reach diabetes, type 2 diabetes remission or reversal. So we do that nutritionally um, in a somewhat uh, non-conventional way in that we don't just teach patients to try to lose weight, to restrict their calories but we provide individualized nutrition plans centered around carbohydrate restriction or individualized carbohydrate restriction. And the key word there is it's highly individualized. To achieve any kind of adherence, particularly on a population level, you have to meet the patient where they are. And I think Dr. Kaufman mentioned this, like really connecting with the patient and um, being the co-pilot as opposed to saying, this is what you have to do. You can try that, but obviously it, it doesn't really work very well on a population level. Specifically, what the patient experience is like when we start uh, the relationship with the patient, again, we use nutrition as the means to improve glycemic control. And then secondly, the actual care team in, includes what we call Verda coaches who provide the uh, multiple touch points a day. Uh, we monitor patients remotely, as I already mentioned earlier. And then our provider's role is obviously to provide the clinical oversight, but most importantly, because we see glycemic improvement and rapid glycemic control, we have to and we can de-prescribe uh, hypoglycemic drugs. So that's a big part of our physician's workflow. And again, this all happens fully virtually. And I think there was, there was a question, um, I, I noticed that, uh, how do you deal with patients who aren't as tech savvy necessarily. And I, I will share a little bit about our outcomes, but we've seen that uh, regardless of age, socioeconomic status, people are very uh, um, receptive to this idea that there's a doctor that you don't necessarily even see on the video and they are asking you to change your medication dose. Um, so just one more brief summary. We use this term virtual or continuous remote care. How is that different from I guess the uh, telemedicine 1.0, which is very episodic. The key difference is uh, we provide this ICU-like experience, which is very continuous. So we monitor patients multiple times a day remotely and then proactively interface with the patient. Again, it really depends on the situation, but typically it's two to five touch points a day. So I guess in the most extreme episodic experience that's two to five touch points a year and we have two to five touch points a day which is absolutely essential for diabetes type of uh, care. Um, lastly I'll, I'll briefly talk about outcomes and then we'll go into the Q&A. So when we say we may be able to put your diabetes into remission or reverse this is not just an anecdotal claim. We now uh, we've run a nearly five-year prospective clinical trial from which we published six peer-reviewed papers some of which were uh, cited in the 2019 and 2020 ADA standards of care as well. And I'll, I'll share some of the results here. So this is uh, one year and two year results. And what you can see here among our patients, the blue line is um, starting from the left. Uh, while we've treated these patients with type 2 diabetes, we've been able to substantially reduce their type 2 diabetes medications, as you can see more than 60% of all uh, medication doses have been eliminated by two years and it's sustained. And of course, even more important is, is the middle chart, which represents glycemic control as measured by HbA1c. So it may be counterintuitive that we could eliminate medications and actually improve glycemic control, but that's indeed what we've been able to do nutritionally. And then body weight, similarly substantial body weight loss and then sustained past two years. The gray bar represents the control arm of 
traditional diabetes management, which, as we all know, uh, usually results in given type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease, slightly increased medication dose and slightly increased uh, A1C over time. So these are obviously wonderful and exciting results in any situation, but particularly at the time of COVID-19 when, as, as you heard from Dr. Radner, um, better glycemic control uh, is absolutely desired to reduce the poor outcomes from COVID-19 as well. Um, there was this uh, question about how do less tech savvy people react to telemedicine? Uh, this chart doesn't directly address that, but what I wanted to show here is that we've now replicated the Verda results across many kinds of populations. On the very right-hand side, the last column is the Veterans Administration. We work with them on a nationwide basis, and you can see we've delivered the same glycemic control, medication eliminations, and weight loss across almost any kind of a population. So I am very optimistic and hopeful that telemedicine is going to be an absolutely accepted mode for clinical delivery, regardless of the type of population you're looking at. Um, let's jump into the Q&A, and I, I see a lot of uh, Q&A coming in, and uh, also our operators here say that those who can run 10 minutes late, so that would be Pacific time until 10.10, and Eastern time, 1 p.m. or 10 past 1 p.m. We will do that, uh, so we have more time for Q&A. So, first, uh, to warm up our esteemed experts here, do you have any pointers for people to go to around uh, telemedicine or COVID-19 and diabetes? Other than obviously, we at Verda Health have aggregated um, scientific research and other resources behind this link, verdahealth.com/covid19. But do any of you want to mention any other resources that people can go, particularly employer benefits leaders that might be tuning in today? I I'll, don't, I'll, don't hear any comments, so. <laughs> I'll, I'll start out on that one, Sami. I, I think the, the first place everyone should go is to the CDC website in terms of what precautions people should be taking to prevent the transmission of COVID-19 and the appropriate quarantine for those who have been exposed. Um, I, I think that ultimately we need to control the pandemic before anything else is going to make any difference. Yeah, there, there, uh, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, I, I agree with Bob. There's, there's a lot of information out there I think um, some of the big concern now is the information on reopening up our employment, our, our, our society. And uh, again, I think the CDC will be the leading source of what still needs to continue to happen. Um, but specifically for people with diabetes, there's a, there's a, a bit, the JDRF just released something yesterday with um, uh, Beyond Type 1. Um, which is their education arm. The ADA has, uh, as well, some information specific to people with diabetes. My, my, I agree. I think go to reputable organizations for the information. Um, I think, uh, th thank you so much. And uh, going to rep reputable organizations is, is a good reminder, as we all have uh, unlimited uh, news sources these days. Um, so lots of uh, questions coming in. So let me, well, first of all, as a logistical thing, uh, this presentation and webinar has been recorded and so you will have access to all this information. There was a question, and there's a lot of questions about Verda, how it is paid and covered and so forth, but let's try to take uh, broader questions here. Um, let's see. Well, there are a lot of Verda questions, so I, I will answer some of these. There's a question of what kind of professions make up the Verda's care team. So we do have providers, uh, nurse practitioners, and then the coaches are usually registered dietitians, nutritionists, and people with nutritional and metabolic health background, and then we, we train them in, in addition to that. Um, 
So th this is a specific question for Dr. Kaufman. How does the medical practitioner integrate behavioral health management in the telehealth setting with either chronic disease or overall health management? How do, how do you do that? So for behavioral health, um, you know, we have a multi-member uh, 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 approach to all of our patients that involves a social worker or a psychologist. And um, following the standards of care by the American Diabetes Association, which I'm sure Bob had a lot to do with, and I'm sure Martin did as well, um, they, they do get a evaluation yearly just to be sure that, um, you know, there aren't any issues. And of course, then during the encounter, if there are issues, then there's a separate referral. But our uh, healthcare, our mental health care providers are very busy on the phone, either doing some individual touch points and actually some groups. Um, there's a lot of common problems that our patients are facing, particularly um, by age group along the pediatric realm. And then we've got one going on for, uh, fam for parents as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's a question, does Verda partner with the major health carriers like Blue Cross Blue Shield? Uh, the answer is in, in many cases, yes. Uh, Blue Shield California, uh, some East Coast Blues. We also work with a lot of self-insured employers who work with Blue's plans, so absolutely. Uh, there were also a lot of questions about um, how does Verda partner with primary care physicians? Do we replace primary care? Do we allow patients to connect with their own care team? The answer is Absolutely, yes. We, we are not trying to replace primary care. That's not our intention. Uh, we are, um, and if you think of primary, traditional primary care visits, which are mostly episodic every three to six months, we do all the care in between. So we, we don't really provide our scope of practice is, is not primary um, care. Um, let's see what else questions I see. Um, this, uh, this is maybe a type two questions more, maybe to Dr. Kaufman. There's a question about closed loop. Um, obviously, it's a closed loop insulin delivery, measuring blood glucose and then insulin to uh, mainly type one diabetics, I guess, for insulin dependent type twos as well. Um, what, what's your take on that and the future of that? Any, any comments on that? Well, I'm sure Bob and Martin would love to chime in as well. I, I obviously believe that enabling a device through very sophisticated algorithms to deliver insulin in response to glucose levels um, is uh, something that has been validated as a methodology to improve glycemic control. Um, so uh, my time when I was at Medtronic was actually to work on and eventually commercialize the first closed loop um, device with the sensor, the pump and the algorithm. But I think it's, it's going to hopefully be more uh, prevalent in uh, the future for type 1 and intensively managed type 2. And there's already a second device that's out. There'll be more to follow. And uh, they do all kind of indicate that there's some improvement in glycemic control. Um, this is a question to Dr. Radner. There's a question around uh, diabetes, inflammation, and uh, COVID-19. What is, well, I, I'll, leave, I'll leave it there. There's probably a half an hour presentation there, but uh, how to think about that briefly. So two important points. The first is that we've known for a hundred years that people with diabetes and hyperglycemia are much more prone to infection. A uh, hundred years ago, it was tuberculosis. Fifty years ago, it was staphylococcus and pneumococcus uh, infections. And now we're seeing increased rates of viral infections in, in folks with diabetes. The impact of COVID-19 is ultimately a cytokine storm that results in death. What you see in that is elevations of TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-1. Uh, a, a lot of these cytokines are elevated in people with diabetes who have hyperglycemia. So that may be one of the mechanisms by which the severity of COVID-19 is, is really accelerated in people with diabetes. Uh, did anybody want to add to that? 
Um, here, here's a very practical question to, to any of you. How would you recommend patients perform routine labs and exams in the telehealth world? Yeah, I, I can speak to that. I mean, so in my primary care practice, what we're finding is that for uh, for non-COVID-19 patients, about 90%, 90% were able to effectively manage uh, remotely uh, through telemedicine, which is which is remarkable if you think about it. And I think a lot of people, you know, hang on to the, you know, the listening of the heart and lung exams and, and all the different pieces. But I think as Dr. Kaufman talked about, I think there's actually a lot of added benefits of telemedicine. Like I'm able to see it into my patients' homes and have them open up their fridges and understand uh, the foods that they're eating and such, but 90% were able to manage uh, virtually. And then for lab tests that are needed to be done, there's there's lots of distributed opportunities uh, in the community for people to get testing. So whether that's just having them come to clinic and just get testing, but otherwise leave, or it's going to the local lab core or Quest. Um, of course, being having connectivity to that data is essential. But fortunately, a lot of those uh, those pipes have been put in place. We're finding, and so you know, we're able to still safely manage them and then patients are at their convenience able to still get that critical lab work they need. Yeah, and I, I would say just from a Berta perspective, what, what we've also done already before COVID-19, we've had patients for due to disabilities or PTSD even, they didn't want to leave their house, so we've sometimes sent someone to the house to do labs and then there are now pretty novel approaches where some of the tests metabolic health panels can be self-administered at, at, at home. And that's probably going to be more and more the, the norm as we move forward. Um, this uh, question might be for uh, Dr. Abrahamson or, or Dr. Kaufman. Uh, do the telehealth visits take longer than an office visit, including the prep time before the visit and charting time after the visit? I don't think they necessarily take longer. Um, but I do think, as Dr. Kaufman said, the time spent is, I think, far more effective because you're nailing in, especially if people are preparing for their visits, as we are recommending, I think the time spent with the patient is actually very effective time spent. But I have not really found that the telehealth visit has taken that much longer than a routine visit. And certainly for the patient, it's a much more convenient way of uh, accessing her or his healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, maybe we'll have time for two more questions. Here's a very clinical question. And obviously, just to be clear, none of us are, are practicing medicine during this, this uh, webinar. So I, I just want to preface this question with that. There's a simple question. Should metformin be stopped only if hospitalized? So the current recommendation from the consensus group in the Lancet is that both metformin and SGLT2 drugs be stopped on admission to the hospital, not prior to that. That the recommendation is to optimize glucose control as an outpatient without trying to change underlying therapies. So I would strongly encourage folks to go to the Lancet Diabetes website. It's this week's edition. And the first author is, is uh, Stefan Bornstein. Uh, thank you. And again, uh, we, none of us are practicing medicine here. So please, uh, if there are, and there are, I know there are some patients who called in. So please talk to your provider uh, before making any, any changes to your, your care. Um, why don't we do, I, I think we are, up in the time and I feel like I'm uh, drinking from the fire hose because questions are coming in, so we won't be able to answer uh, even a fraction of these. Why don't we do a, a brief closing round? Any closing thoughts? I think we have a lot of benefits leaders, um, patients, other healthcare practitioners on the call. Uh, so we'll just do a quick 10, 15 second closing round, whatever are your final thoughts. So we'll start from, uh, I'll just go through this uh, list that I see in front of me. So Dr. Abrahamson, any closing thoughts? No, I just think, uh, well, again, I want to thank you, Sami, for the opportunity. I want to thank my co-presenters for the opportunity to be part of a terrific team. Um, this, is, this is an opportunity, I think, for people who do have diabetes to take a, a, an introspective look at the, how they manage themselves 
and take advantage of all opportunities online and other to really um, uh, take uh, good care of themselves, leverage technology, um, focus on lifestyle, and uh, by being at home, it doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't exercise and get enough sleep. There's all those things that are necessary. Watch, watch uh, your dietary, uh, your, your diet, eat healthy, uh, and stay well. Uh, uh, thank you. How about Dr. Radner? Any closing thoughts? I can't say it any better than Martin just did. Uh, well said. Uh, Dr. Nandi? Yeah, I think I would just say that, you know, healthcare is more complex than ever for uh, the people that we're responsible for. They're going to be dealing with COVID and they're going to be dealing with their chronic conditions. And I think thinking about opportunities to simplify that, get them that trusted expertise um, and help them manage through this uh, is going to be absolutely uh, essential to making through it. So thanks for the time. Yeah. And Dr. Kaufman, uh, any, any closing thoughts from you? Well, just in conclusion, obviously, um, our, our world has changed. The world of delivering healthcare has certainly dramatically changed. And fortunately, we're all learning new things. But I think one of the things we're going to see as a result of this is that telehealth actually enabled our patients through a global pandemic to remain healthy and well and to get this, you know, essentially the same benefits that they likely would have gotten with a traditional healthcare visit. Thank you. And I'll just conclude by, by saying thank you to all of you experts for joining and everyone for tuning in. This was a, a pleasure and thank you for sharing your expertise for the benefit of it's like um, uh, hundreds, hundreds of people who joined. So thank you very much and stay safe, stay well and uh, make most out of it. Thank, thank you. you.